a lot of normal people, by normal, I mean people who didn't go through that process or who didn't have, you know, who didn't have to flee the country without their choice. It is not like you're planning your vacations and choosing which airline to pick. It is like a snake is chasing you and you don't care if there is trespassing signs or is a private property signs. You just jump. Hello everybody and welcome to this new episode of Different Boats, Same Storm, a video podcast aimed at kindling empathy amidst this global pandemic. You know, speaking of empathy, today we have a guest who has lived a life that most of us can only ever imagine, or not even imagine really, have only ever seen on TV, heard about in the news, seems very foreign, seems very nebulous, but here is a man who has gone through it all and has done so with a lot of courage. Jivet Ilion, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Thank you so much. We're really excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, uh, Jivet, it is, it's funny how the two of us met because we were at this case competition at the University of Toronto, which is where all of us um, study. And Jivet was there and I was there with a couple of my friends and we were a team and then we were just randomly paired together. And that's just how we ended up getting to know each other. But at the time, I must say this, I had no idea about your backstory. And I found out we, the three of us, uh, the friends had gone together, we found out when it was released, so to say. And I'm not gonna give a lot more than that. I'll let you take the lead. So Jivet, who are you? What is your story? <laughs> that, is, um, that is actually a 357 page story and that <laughs> didn't even cover the whole story. Right. But yeah, it is. it feels like it was only a few couple of months ago that case competition happened, but it's been a year, over a year right now, by now. Yeah, and the world looked very different then. Very, very different. Yeah, and most of the time I had a few opportunities in the past that to actually talk about it, but I was always reluctant to tell it all, to release it. Partly, I wasn't convinced that anybody out of my friends who went through that same process would ever grasp like what it was, would ever grasp the depth of that whole island's locked up, removed from civilization's experience. So I was very reluctant to tell anyone literally how it all started and how it all ended. It was just too much. But um, when I had a, I had a book deal with penguins um, that kind of gave me a lot of flexibility, not, uh, not limiting the word limit, um, not limiting a lot of other portions of where um, other elements that I think publisher normally adjust to make economical sense or economic sense of the book. So finally I said, if I have an unlimited amount and I have like this, uh, I have an amazing editor. So I said, why not? Um, I started before the writing process about started about actually about two years. But um, when it finished just by the time of pandemic. Now, Jivet, I, I see your building of the suspense even more and more, and we love to see it. But, and I'm just going to put the question out there. What most people don't end up signing book deals with Penguin to write about their life story. So what exactly was this life story? <laughs> So in about 2013, um, early 2013, when the, the violence was at the peak back in Burma, which is now known as the, the Rohingya genocide, uh, was 
officially recognized by UN and other few, but generally known as um, as Rohingya genocide was at the peak, and we had um, we had reached at a point where pretty much nobody is safe. Everybody has to either get out of the country whenever they can or while they can mostly or for those who can move for example um you have old people you have sick people you have people with certain conditions um can move and then like they just try to relocate to other part but i was one of the person who actually was able to leave the country and later on you uh, i'm pretty sure you um you can google it out like there were a lot of photos and horrible story but don't i recommend um people getting shot even while they were fleeing so i was one of those um lucky one who got to get out of the country while the whole genocide didn't explode um killing up to hundreds of thousands of people and then i began to to seek for refuge and that took me to several countries six countries um three continents and four years on a detention center in a remote island in the middle of nowhere in Pacific Sea, um, in the South Pacific Sea and finally end up here in Canada on a random Christmas Eve um, without knowing what Canada is or without knowing who a single soul in Canada like about 48 hours beforehand so it was a complete unexpected unplanned journey full of chaos and full of you know miseries yeah I mean there's so much there so you're an author uh, and that's such a powerful part of what we'll get to and you were talking about the experience of having a publisher and getting published and all of that. But the story underlying that is that of you being a refugee and having to flee your own country. Javit, I'd, I'd like to push, um, go back in time a little bit before the Rohingya genocide. Um, you know, growing up in Burma, which is now Myanmar, um, what was your experience like during that time and uh, leading up to that time of having to flee your country? What was life like for you? Life in the earlier was, I wouldn't say it was bad or worse, especially after what I've been through. The, those times actually seem like a sweet days. Uh, but it was um, pretty limited, pretty limited in a way. You are feeling the pressure squeezing you day by day. And one of the um, concepts I tried to emphasize in the book was people only see the physical violence when it made to the news or it made to the media. But genocide doesn't happen overnight. It has a lot of precursor beforehand. For example, in the case of Rohingya, there were um, about 80 to 90 years ago, there were the killing of the language and the scripture. And then it came to controlling the populations. And it came down to, um, at at my grandfather to my parents, it came down to a stripping of their citizenship. So basically they ceased to exist on legal papers. Then it came down to, um, it came down to like access to health cares and access to education. So it was like a, a squeezing sort of um, prisons day by day, it is a squeezing. And then the genocide in the form of physical genocide happened at the very last and when it exploded. When it exploded, that's the time that people get to know. But actually the best time to prevent or to, you know, take measures of any genocides, I believe, is in the earlier days where I spent my earlier days. And with the genocide, when you have someone chasing you down, when someone, a government's trying to actively oppress you you don't you don't have a planned organized life because you don't know what's going to happen the next day so it was pretty unpredictable 
you know, a lot of um, up and downs, but most of the time downs because, you know, it is constantly squeezing you. For example, in our, um, in our culture, the frog in the boiling water is uh, a very good example. And people usually use it because it's not killing you once in a while. It is heating you up to the point where you are so weak, you can't even escape. So that was the genocide experience in my earlier day. And I would say pretty much all of my um, peers would go through the same, if not worse. Right. Genocide is not, it's not a single strike. It's yeah, like that is a thousand very, cuts. It is a very big misconception because people only learn when something bad happened bad as bad enough for the media to give you a few minutes but actual genocides happen way 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 much earlier than that and this is this has been consistent as far as um other genocides that i know they were in the in the in the houthi case like it was radio and that radio station broadcasting happened months years earlier so it's been constantly this showering of propaganda until they reach to a point of where people's mindsets are, uh, you know, it is justifiable to kill these people or it is justifiable to do so. Yeah, it's it, it's this level of dehumanization that occurs over time. And like you said, it's a step by step by step process that doesn't happen immediately. Uh, I, I mean, it, it's so it's so much to take in, uh, even just hearing, and I, I can't imagine experiencing that. So, you know, Jevith, it's twenty thirteen. You've seen the signs build up over the over time, um, and so now you're at this point where you've had to flee your home. Can you talk a bit about that journey? Um, I mean, right after leaving your home and leaving everything that you knew behind, where did you go, and what was that immediate step like? And if I might just add one more food for thought there, you know, for everybody, to me, and I think we can all agree, home signifies comfort, home signifies confidence, home signifies freedom. And therefore, like, even when I leave home, I'm, I'm living halfway across the world away from family. And even though I love my time here, and I'm, I, I'm not homesick, but every time I do leave home, there's always that this pinch inside you. Um, now I'm curious as to what that was like for you because yes, it was home, but the feelings of comfort and freedom and empowerment were not exactly there from everything that you've said so far. So I'm curious as to what that felt like itself. Yeah, let me go to you first and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. So that if we go a little bit deeper to the point of like not comfort let's say the time you leave the home you can forget about the comfort on the on the spectrum of the suffering even when you suffer probably the same conditions by same rulers it is different in a way that when you suffer at home it is distributed in a in a sort of like collective suffering where on the other hand you have no one to look back to. You have no family members, you know, to shine a light if you end up um, in the holes or something like that. So it became this whole weight became uh, weight fall. Only you and only your shoulders. There is no one to look back to. And that is the biggest difference that I have felt. Even though the sufferings were sometimes much worse, that collectiveness suffering make it right. tolerable at least and i think right. we human creature always try to um compare ourselves to the environment like the suffering the happiness even the the wealth are most of the time it is relative you only see how much your neighbor made to compare yourself so the same when it is a collective suffering you say oh everybody's suffering you know it is um you kind of become mentally tolerable. You are you you have like more guts to take in, but when it is on your own, it's just multiply suffering part. So when I left yeah, Egypt, go ahead, go for it. Now I was addressing the other question. 
I, I, I was just saying that, you know, all that just goes to say that resilience and uh, um, displaying strength in these times is all about the pillars of support that you have around you. Um, and at home, that is something that you inherently have because of the collective existing at home, which just does not exist outside. Uh, but over to you. Yeah, resilience is uh, interesting as you brought this up, like, because there were countless of time, countless, literally, I couldn't count. I, I can't even count right now, even if I were to sit down and count times I gave up, because it there was just as if you were, I was hitting a wall, like there was no way to go through it. But then once you don't have a choice, you just, you know, try to push yourself a little bit more and see what happened. And most of the breakthrough happened within that narrow period once you gave up, but you somehow, because you don't have a choice, you try to push a little bit more. That's the, that's the gap where breakthrough and a lot of ahas, like there were, um, uh, there were a time where, like I said, you know, fuck this, I'm not dealing with this anymore. Like I'm done. Like I, I was literally drained emotionally, mentally, energy, and financially, like you just don't have the mean to go to go forward anymore. You gave up. And that's when I got surprised. Like that's that's that has been. I hope. I wish it is not the case for anyone else because it's extremely, um, extremely anxious and extremely uncomfortable process. Like where you are to the point of burnout. You gave up. Then the breakthrough happened. But at the same time, I'm not sure if it is a. Uh, you know, universe saying, is it the best you can give? I want more, like demanding from you more. Um, but at the end, you end up as a as a better, as a more um, resilient person. So when I was in, in um, leaving Burma, I was I end up uh, in Indonesia, in um in the whole this whole sort of um refugee process. By process, I mean there is a process on the paper, but in reality, it is nowhere close. There is, you know, there is there wasn't a process at all. So I ended up in Indonesia, and Indonesia, like a lot of people asked me um, in the past few months, like why did you choose this? Why did you choose? For example, um, I end up in Australia, which I will come in a, in, a, in a moment. Why did you go to Indonesia? Why did you go to um, Christmas Island? Why did you go to Australia? Why did you choose it? A lot of normal people, by normal, I mean people who didn't go through that process or who didn't have, you know, who didn't have to flee the country without their choice. It is not like you're planning your vacations and choosing which airline to pick. It is like, a snake is chasing you and you don't care if there is trespassing signs or is a private property signs. You just jump. Whatever fence it is, you just jump over the one that has the most survival chance. And that's the process. There were no plan. There were no Airbnb booking. There were no flight choosing. There was no economics and um, business assist choices it is literally whatever choice you have at that moment given you probably don't have you know i didn't have proper documents you know financial backup and all those sort of restricting factor like that was the choice i had in the front and i made it and this is this have been a very misconception like oh why they could have they could have go to there they could have go to there like i've seen a lot of um, finger pointing out like why did you come here like when uh, we mistreat you like no, nobody chose to come here. And most of all, nobody ever likes to leave home. Like it is the most uncomfortable and the hardest decision anyone could make leaving their home forever and not being able to go back. And nobody ever want to go and to, you know, leave, abandon their home permanently. And nobody choose a place where they could go. These are like the circumstances, the situations at the time and the restricting factors there were. People end up in a place 
whether it be refugee camp, whether it is um, a third country, whether it is the neighboring um, border, whether it is the bush in the case of Burma. Um, yeah, there were a lot of combination of a lot of hard decisions. In my case, it was Indonesia. And I was in this whole settlement process set up by UNACR. And like you guys are like you guys are right now, like back then, I didn't have a single clue what this process is, what this going through. Like so, you know, um you see a body like UN taking care of this, you would assume, you know, there is an orderly process to get through it. Um and all the sort of normal assumption that you would have one when you're looking from the outside, but in the inside it was nowhere close to it. It was remotely close to any sort of you know hope or any sort of um means to make a life there yeah like i mean we've gotten so deep into this question of refugees and the refugee crisis in the world at large already i think it's such an important discussion i mean you didn't really have direction and although people might look at refugees and say why didn't you go to this place or why didn't you go to that place? The, the fact of the matter is you don't have a choice and you're, you're literally fleeing for your life. You're going away from a place where your villages and everything was burned down and you're trying to, you're trying to stay alive. And I think that is probably something that people do overlook. And so Jevet, um, you got to this point where you're, you go from your home to Indonesia uh, and you're finding that the UNHCR, none of that is really like, as, as perfect as someone might think the UN managing this crisis would actually be. How, what was the next step of your journey to get from Indonesia to Australia? And, um, you know, the, the story that your, your book is based on escaping from the island. Yeah. And you're right. It is most of the time, not a choice. It is, I, I, most, I just refer to so that people, uh, we just can make, you know, relate to it is, the shortest that I can summarize it to is like it is a flight and fight decisions. You don't do your list of pros and cons and you don't evaluate your options. It is you fly or you fight. That's it. So when I was in Indonesia, I was I spent like a few good weeks um figuring out how to get this process and I had um some sort of directions and help like from my fellow countrymen who arrived there earlier than me. And to be able to talk to a UN representative, like you have to line up at this um, UNACR office in Jakarta, downtown Jakarta, like three, two early in the morning, the office open at nine and you have like literally six to seven city block of like line lining up people A, but not getting to talk to anyone yet. That line is just to get a token that will give you a chance to talk to a UN representative in about two to three months. In my case, it was two months. So I lined up for a few days, didn't get it. And then the next day I didn't come back from lining up. You just like slept over there, like in the nearby places. And then like you go there like about 1 a.m. in the morning or two, around two um, and you line up and you find finally got a token, a piece of paper, literally, that says it is not a piece of paper as if like, you know, uh, an official document. It is just a little token where it says a number. And that number is supposed to give me to talk to someone in the UN system in about two to three months. Meanwhile, I was, you know, adjusting life in this sort of refugee ghettos in the outside of Arskara of Indonesia, uh, Jakarta. That's where I learned more about this system, the whole how I met people who were in their seventh year, in their fifth year, living there, hoping the UN will pick up their case for a resettlement. And if this five to seven years were like not, not a time they were provided with the means to make, you know, um, a life that any meaningful person will have. It's not that to provide you with a luxury hotel. It is like you don't have literally the permit to work. You don't have the permission to go to school. You don't have to do 
anything meaningful that will help you to make look forward. And we, I, my experience has been we as a human, we always survive with the hope for the future. We look forward and we work to it. Like if I don't have the mean, if I have guaranteed that I'm not gonna, you know, leave tomorrow, like there is no way I would do, you know, what I'm doing to do. Like the most of the time, I think we make our life and tolerate our chores looking that tomorrow, looking toward tomorrow. When you take out that hope, be it education, be it um, employment, be it your career, like anything long term, you essentially make them like zombie who kind of live day to day life without any hope. So I met people like who have been living from a few years all the way up to 70 years and they had like their own share of, you know, turbulence in the process and stuff. So I made the decisions of like to try um, Australia, which is about, I forgot the exact kilometer, but there was a, a relatively small island about two to three hundred, um, two to three hundred kilometers um, south of Jakarta, which is an Australian territory where you know you can claim the silence as you arrive there. So, I decided to take up the chance, even though the survival chance was you know rarely low. Um, having no life, having no hopes. Also, at the same time, I was running out of money. You can only you are only provided with a certain relief rations if you are registered in the system with the UN. If you are not, you kind of have to make by yourself. And if you can work, I actually, it boggled my mind. How are you as a refugee who left everything behind is able to make the life without being able to work. So it is a lot of like dysfunctional um, pieces there, like things that hasn't been thought through. To be honest, that refugee hold system, the way it is practiced, it, it was created with the, with the World War II in mind. So post-World War II period, a lot of those rules were still the same. So it, it didn't necessarily adjust to the modern days. So, you know, um, if you see from that context, if you see from that lens, you kind of you know, pick it up the dysfunctional pieces there and then able to relate why they're in in a, in a certain way. And you've given you an issue, it's extremely bureaucratic and it takes, you know, a good amount of time to make any changes at all. So a lot of pieces were like dysfunctional and things were not working. I just didn't see myself living in a ghetto for seven years without doing anything. And I attempt um, to reach to which is the Australian island called Christmas Island. And truth to be told, and at the, at the process, the, the boat that I embarked um, sank in the middle of nowhere. So it was, um, the, this was where the book started actually, where I kind of gave up, made peace with myself. And, um, you know, Made peace with myself, literally ready mentally, emotionally, um, to go down the water. I uh, I would send you a synopsis of the of the very first part of the uh, of the book because it is on the website. Uh, I don't think anybody has like um, it is free of copyright leave leave out by the publisher. So if you want to attach to it, that's where the book started because that was that gap that gap that I earlier uh, I talked earlier where I give up because. I tried everything I had in my capacity and then like I just tried to push a little bit and that's where most of the time, most of the breakthrough might happen and this was the very beginning of it. I, I have no words. I absolutely just have no words. Uh, you know, while I'm processing this and I'm, uh, by the looks of our best face, he's also processing this. Mm. I can just say that hope is what keeps us all going in, in, in all respects. I mean, pandemic, no pandemic, 
any given time, the pos even the, the slightest possibility of a brighter future, of a future, actually, just any future, it makes you want to keep working towards it. That the light at the end of that tunnel is what gives you the energy to even want to go through the tunnel. But when there is no light, when there is no hope, how it's almost unfair and almost too rich of anybody to expect uh, people to go for it. And, and in your case, I mean, it's, it's so poetic, morbidly, in, but it's poetic where you were literally, you'd made peace with yourself to give way to the water and sink to its depths rather than fight it because all you had done so far was fight it but the water kept fighting back and if I may ask and I know you were alluding to this earlier the gap between giving up and then pushing a little bit more what exactly went through your mind in that moment when you had made peace with yourself to let go that led you to not let go well, the very first one came as a surprise because I actually didn't expect to make to the next day. I didn't expect to see the sun again. So that was that was it. That was the end of it. And when I did see that we, the book only went down like about half and the, the other half was literally still floating like on the on a on a nearby island called Binanko. And when there is like sun and you still see you have a day and these all are happening while I don't know how to swim. So that was the most terrifying factor for me because this was going on and I didn't know how to swim. And I had an accident earlier in my life where I, um, I drowned in a swimming pool while trying to learn. Like that was it. From that on, for me, water was strictly for showering nothing else. And then this was happening on a sinking boat. I made peace to myself because once it goes down, I literally have like no chance of making anything, even if there's land. So the next day when the sun comes up, um, it came up like around 7, 6.30, I think that morning when, um, I opened my eyes only to be surprised, actually disappointed, like disappointedly surprised because my prayer before the night was just to die peace in peace and quietly without going through the same trauma of the drowning that I had earlier. That's the only thing that I didn't want to go through. I was yeah. ready to die. I was ready to go down peacefully in quiet. So my prayer was to go down in, while I was asleep. So when I woke up, it was kind of like disappointment. Like, why are, you, why are you giving me this? Like, I don't deserve this, like to get another day. But um, we keep like, not only me, a lot of other people who were also, um, you know, in the same journey, like try their own ways, whether it's shouting or making fires until a fisherman nearby, you know, pick up the distress signals and then like came up to help. And that was the very first moment of like, you know, sometimes even though you give up, if you try, some things happen. It is not all the time. Sometimes it's happened. So we were rescued by, um, by a gang of like a group of fishermen. And when I landed on the shore, you know, people were hugging and people were um, you know embracing like their family members and whatnot for me the most satisfying probably the biggest thing i craved was the just to touch the land with my feet again so when i land on the shore touching the land with the uh, with the feet was like my biggest moment at that point and i didn't stop there with the with the first boat sinking you know there were a lot of other um 
a lot of other dramas that we probably might not have time to go through in the middle um like once the boat sink we were detained again in, in um in an indonesian small facility where i had to get run out of it you know not having money um getting on the plane and um trying to go to a jakarta city where i already came um i previously left and i was cornered again with the same thing like i couldn't make alive i couldn't go to unacr and the settlement is like seven years wrong and i just recently almost got sink and killed uh drowned in the boat uh, in the sea for me to make another attempt with the same boat knowing it might not make it was just horrifying beyond horrifying and there were countless of night like i stop myself like from making the decision like this is the only choice like tried um other options but at the end when nothing's prevail i had to make a second boat journey in this in similar situations but this time i kind of did um calculated decisions of surviving 50% and not surviving 50% so if you know at least i have a chance 50% while i was sitting there it was um it was a slow burn like the genocide in burma like it will take 7 years but by the time it's 7 years you are to drown so i kind of take 50% chance but i did this time i didn't carry um any clothing or anything extra the only thing that i carried was water bottle one car tire tube and one hand inflator if the boat goes down i will just inflate the tires uh, the tires and float that was the only thing that i carried at that point if i were not to make that push when i gave up already i think we would have probably never be talking here so that was the gap that was the breakthrough i i'm I, i'm still like yeah at the harvest saying i mean your story just becomes more and more inspiring jevit but like every step of the way when you were faced with adversity and we're talking about extreme adversity here like your your ship sunk your boat sunk more than twice uh you were detained multiple times and you talk about the emotional torture too not just that physical torture but the emotional torture of i mean not having yeah not having anything to look forward to uh yeah i i just i i wonder and, and so ultimately then after going from indonesia to, and you're trying to get to australia but you were at a different island and uh is this when you ultimately got to manus island is that the point of the story that um you're talking about now So I did make to Australia which was Australian territory and the Australian jurisdictions but um yeah while I was on the sea there was a sudden law changes in Australian system where they no more give refuge to anyone seeking refuge by sea Ironically the Australian national anthem was plenty of sea and plenty of land so but they stopped giving asylum to anyone who comes by sea um and this happened while i was on the sea again um it's like just my life pretty much everywhere just when i reach there things changes and you have to start something new completely unheard of yeah. i arrived to australia where i spent like about um about five and a half months around six months yeah in a detention facility um called christmas island detention and from there the australians um uh a more right leaning party came up in power and the whole um refugee not just not giving asylum it became like um indefinite detention in a remote offshore prisons which was and i i was uh, i was just thinking earlier when you mentioned there was no light at the end of the tunnel and this was that exact term i described like that period of the detention for the next 4 years in my in the book where your detention was definite indefinite meaning i didn't know if i would ever get out i didn't know if i have an end to it at all to begin with and i still have friends who are um doing their ninth years in the detention and there was just no 
no tunnel, like no lights at the end of the tunnel. You don't have a reason at the end of the day to go through the suffering that the torture that was put in place in the prison um, to make to the other day. And um, multiple times, countless of times probably that I question why should I go through this torture just to repeat it the next day. And we, in that prison where we were the whole refugees, like people who ever seek asylums past July 19, 2013, where 2013 were sent to um, two remote islands in the middle of nowhere and locked up, removed from the civilizations, very little to no contact with the outside world. It was kind of this, uh, I describe it in a way that like, it's, it just feel like it is a human experiments, the social experiment that you would see in sci-fi in the middle of nowhere because you are literally in the middle of nowhere and you got nowhere to go and it was um it was another version of the genocidal experience that i had but on with a different flavor with a different coating over it and um in a different way for example he in, in the prison it was most of the tortures were um not physical but psychological and the suicide rate in the prisons went up to a point where people were hanging so much, like the um, the knife to cut down the hose, uh, the noose of the of the hanging rope became a standard guard uniform. Like they can go run and get the knife and cut down, the knife became a standard part of the patrolling guard. So it was like extreme version of um, human experiment where my world kind of turn upside down world inside of my head, like not physical world. I started to see things differently and um, yeah, that's how um, at the end I decided like it was just not for me. And if I'm not gonna take things on my own hand, nothing's gonna change. There were no angels, there were no, you know. And we used to say, don't expect don't expect mercy from your oppressor and it was, I just took it up like literally and metaphorically and I end up hmm, make an attempt to get out of it. I'm happy that it worked because it was such a you know ridiculous plan. Uh, you know when you said that that's those are the kinds of things that you read in dystopian novels and think that that couldn't possibly happen in real life. No real human being with a soul and a conscience could inflict that upon a fellow human being intentionally. And then yet you've lived through that. And the last thing I want to do is, is, is press on that because I can sense it and I can only, I can, I can't even imagine what, what that must have been like, um, and going through that. Yeah. I asked myself multiple times, like it just, I just couldn't process it at that time. How on earth that sort of torture could be done in this age to a fellow human being. It was just mind boggling for me at that time. Like how, on earth, this is possible, this is happening. So I had like, um, at first my theory was, you know, Menace was so remote, so removed from the civilization, like there were no journalists. Um, phones were contraband, basically you can't communicate with outside, like, um, and uh, yeah, it was like completely removed from the outside world. So my theory was, it was out of sight, out of mind sort of like disaster happening so i did um i did have a journal back then out of boredom you know things interesting thing has happened like when you have nothing to do um you know we used to do other crazy things um a lot of dark jokes which probably too dark for the outside like you would do you know and race like the ants that were passing you would just raise them like claim them the hand race and um I remember one time um, one of my friends was counting the nails 
you know, on the roof, like when you lie down and you count the nails, like how many nails. Are... And then he came to me, but uh, I, I had like 138 nails on my right side of the of the roof. And then by that point, I end up, I actually name half of them. So like, did you actually, so people actually name them. So interesting things happen, uh, jokes aside. So I end up like writing a journal just out of boredom, also thinking that shit, whatever that was going at that point, got to see the light of the day at some point. Yeah. I wrote a journal. Um, I was just purely um, for logistics and legal reason I was um, journaling. And I end, end up compiling it to uh, um, to about 17 page report, which was um, I anonymously submitted in the Australian Senate. So that I, I was basically satisfying myself that, look, this is not something happening in the dark behind the curtains. This is known to the Senate and this is right in the report. So that like it was, um, it can be said like it is out of sight, out of mind. But that wasn't the case, actually. The torture, yeah. the whole scheme was designed to break down people, to make the most out of suffering by default. So like, and then I adjusted when I learned new things, when I learned such factors, um, that it was intentional. And that's where my understanding of it came, where humans, individual level, as an individual, like, are not that cap capable of, like, to do such things. But when we all became as, um, as a part of organized organizations, whether it be it army, be it a government or, um, be it even rebel, like you kind of don't feel that responsibility onto yourself. You kind of think it is the organization, it is the government, it is the, you know, this whole regime that's doing, I'm not doing it. So that responsibility from individual self was like removed while they do it. A lot of prison guards like that I, I used to talk to would say, Oh, I'm just doing my job, you know, if I don't do it, somebody else would do it. So I end up concluding those sort of horrible things are possible if it is done by the, in an organized manner. Like when I, I made here, like I studied uh, those sort of thing and a lot of um, atrocities around the world and in the history, um, all the horrible things happen in some sort of organized manner, in some sort of like, organizational command under organizational command yeah atar before you yeah, um that, that's yeah atar before, before you ask your question actually i'm just uh, i i again uh Javith, I, I was reading this guardian article that explained your experience and I, I just to give everyone context about what you said um i mean what what you told um the, the people at the guardian the conditions on manus were as bad as myanmar you lived in a cramped modified shipping container which roasted in oppressive heat. Uh, rancid food was filled with debris, including stones and human teeth. Locals attacked the compound, thinking that the asylum seekers were terrorists. Uh, they shot at your accommodation, leaving bullet holes in the walls and forcing inmates to shelter behind their mattresses. Uh, and so you write in your book, uh, the prison looked and felt like the scene of a horror movie about a perverse site for human experimentation a floodlit laboratory in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I mean, like you said, Atarv, yeah. Atarv, go forward with your question, please. I, I, oh, okay. Gotta, gotta compose myself uh, because this just keeps getting more and more emotionally charged. I, something that you said that really, really, stood out to me from that was just that when it's just an individual you, you don't expect them to inflict such such atrocities and even if they do it's hard to for you to imagine for them to get away with it but when it's when our institutions are designed intentionally to do these then that just becomes the norm and it's scary how easily we just accept that especially when we're not on the receiving end of it. And I know that, I mean, in this can, this also applies to 
other conversations and other very pertinent issues around us, speed or the way we incarcerate people in society, be they asylum seekers or not, uh, in anything and everything that we do, the moment you dehumanize the person that you are inflicting the pain upon, and at the same time, dehumanize any particular person to blame either for the atrocities, it just seems like people get away with it. I think we're, we kind of got, we kind of accustomed to this point of where if it is done by a legal authority, regardless of where they derive that authority from, or if it is worse, it's like if it is democratically um, elected persons, uh, which was the case for Australia. Um, pe- we kind of got um, accustomed to accepting it as a justifiable. You would assume in a democratic institute, you know, things will be based on reasons, you know, and logic, not necessarily to the benefits or the profits of certain individuals or certain parties. But that was, that is actually very far, very, very far from the reality. Like a lot, we had like, you know, a lot of um, legal things. Hitler's party was like democratically elected just for the context. So we had a lot of bad things. Jim Crow's was a law legally passed, uh, you know, in the house. Like we had a lot of, legal things, democratically elected parties and institutions that had done terribly. So whenever there were like institutions in the name of the people or derive their power, like, you know, democratic by the consent, it's not always justifiable or their action is not always like above what is immediate, like what is, um, what is in the context. There was a lot of, um, I've gone like in depth, but I, I'm not sure if we have time for that. Like there were a lot of dirty, dirty, dirty things that has been done under people's name and thus citizens will never learn of, will never heard of. Yeah. And, and Javid, if you have time, we're, we're so happy to continue this discussion. I mean, like what you what you just mentioned right now about legal authorities and justice and injustice, I think majority of people if they, when they hear your story and if they get the chance to, they empathize with you and they, they try, they, they feel that injustice and they understand that it's wrong. But it, it's like, I, I can't even comprehend that this sort of thing is still happening today. And you said it yourself that in this day and age, this stuff should not be happening. Uh, your experience is one of, again, overcoming this extreme adversity not in the conventional sense but at the literal sense at the physical sense at the emotional sense uh overcoming all of this uh, i i mean before we get into that story of your actual prison break uh which you know is the is what your entire book is kind of leading up to wh- what was it again like you mentioned briefly what was it though internally that made you say you know what i'm going to get out of here i'm going to get to another place so I can continue with my life? What what was it internally that led you to believe and think in that way? It was, precise word would be, it was cornered to a point where, you know, I just didn't have a choice, but that didn't come easily. I had like um, a few unsuccessful suicide attempts prior to that. So I tried to find the end of that place in other means. Like I I stopped writing, um, I stopped counting the days because I at that point I was at a point of where, you know, um doesn't matter whatever the crime is, every prisoner like has a date, has a sentence they could look up to and say, oh on this day I'm gonna get out of here. But for me it was the opposite. The more I stay there the more it is becoming solid that I'll, I'm gonna be there for longer. For example, when I when I arrived on that island, there were only one prison. By the time I was leaving, there were three prison extension built in front of my eyes. It was it was like watching your coffins being built in front of you. So it was like, and it didn't stop there. 
it was constantly expanding and getting harsher, getting more harder. And on um, on a day, on the somewhere around 2016, November, December, um, I was given this paper of like whether I'll be sent back to Burma, which was, you know, uh, a guaranteed death at that point, or to a higher security prison. So I said this, this was just enough. When I initially made the plan to get out, um, which took about, you know, six months to eight, six to eight months to materialize, um, I didn't know it would work. It, it is a ridiculous plan because it was not just the detention that was controlled by the, by the Australian government at that point. It was the whole island. So, and there were nothing around about two to 300 kilometers surrounding the island other than water. Not to forget the fact that I don't know how to swim, even though that wasn't possible. And so I didn't know it would work. And again, I gave up, but I didn't have a choice. So I just tried. If, if it worked, I have like, you know, whatever five, 10% of chance of making it out of there rather than just if I were to sit around and um, rot in the system. So I took a leave of faith and just because I didn't have any other choice. When we recorded this episode, we never imagined there'd be so, so much uh, to the extent that we didn't think that a single episode would do Javet's story justice. So we've decided to break this up in the two episodes to truly showcase and celebrate his story. And, you know, this really is the epitome of different boats, same storm. Uh, Javet's story is one of overcoming adversity, as, as we've said so many times. And to learn about how he actually escaped from prison, escaped from that torturous prison that he talked about at Manus, uh, be sure to check out the episode next Saturday. It'll be released at the same time and we'll be able to wrap up this story, learning about how he escaped from prison, how he came to Canada reintegrated into society and wrote his book. So be sure to check it out. Uh, we're very excited to release the next part with you. We'll be back again next week. Not a different guest this time, but the same time in a different boat in the same storm.